so I'm a big believer in strategic trimming, which kind of treats preventative trimming as one aspect. Um, and then trying to focus on those cows and we can talk about that later. But then when we get to kind of therapeutic trimming, so cows that need to be trimmed, um, I like to think that there's kind of like three different populations of those type of cows. There's a the newly lame cow. So those are cows that have really never been lame. And we try to find those cows with strong detection programs, whether it be technology or people. Um, and then there's kind of the recheck cow. So once they've been treated, they should be on a recheck list, especially if they've received the block. And then there's their chronic cows. And then I structure my trimming programs for those cows more aggressively. So those are the kind of the le cows that have had a history of lesions, because we have to remember that lameness is a chronic condition, whether it be digital dermatitis or sole ulcers on white lines or hoof horn lesions. Welcome to the Dairy Health Black Belt Podcast. I'm Luciano Cacheta. I'm your host today. And today I have uh, the opportunity to talk to my colleague. We actually have our offices are next door to each other. Uh, we, we exchange uh, ideas on a regular basis. So today we have Dr. Gerard Kramer uh, coming to talk to us about uh, lameness and foot lesions. Welcome, Gerard. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you again for... Uh, for uh, accepting this invitation uh, and you as one of the leading uh, experts on the field of uh, lameness and foot health. Uh, can you tell us a little bit like how did you get into that field? <laughs> uh, yeah, probably. Well, it goes back into when I was in my fun year of veterinary school, I did a rotation with Dr. Jan Shear and Sarah Van Amstel. Um, so it kind of got me into lameness a little bit. And then I thought there was an opportunity for veterinarians to get involved. And for various reasons, I ended up doing graduate work and they wanted me to work on culling. And I said, lameness is related to culling. So then I got some funding for lameness and that's kind of been the start of my lameness career. Wise Genetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. That's good. Yeah, and and uh, how, how do you feel like the, the field of trimming or lameness itself? Like, how do you feel from when you start to now? Like, what's the progress? How is it very different? Is it the same? Is it evolving? Uh, I'd say it's evolving. Um, I'm not sure as an industry, we're much further ahead. Maybe the cases we're seeing are a little earlier, but there's still, I would argue, too much lameness. Um, the awareness is probably a little higher, but as far, especially if we think like it's a veterinary podcast, as far as veterinarians being involved in it. When I went to vet school, it was Dr. Jan Shear and Dr. Chuck Gard, and now it's me and maybe Dr. Nigel Cook. So I don't think we've progressed that far as far as the veterinary profession. Yeah, and it's interesting because, and I'm biased speaking with you on this because you're here and you're teaching our students. And at least at the University of Minnesota, uh, we see a lot of students that kind of pick that up, right? Like they they see the value of it, like you mentioned. They see the the huge opportunity that's there that people are not taking advantage, and they keep uh, uh, taking advantage of that and like taking that on. And you and some of your colleagues have been also. Uh, you have like a uh, trimming school and you also have some uh, courses for uh, new grads. Is that, that right? Yes. Um, yeah, we recently started a trimming school um, together with Kinder Ground. So Dr. Jennifer Walker kind of coordinates this and supports it in the background financially. Um, and then a trimmer and myself, so Jamie Sullivan and myself, we kind of run three trim schools. Um, just trying to fill a void um, that was created when um, Carl Berge, that, who used to run trim schools, um, is not retired, but retired from running trim schools. Um, so there's kind of void for the industry where people wanted to come and take trimming schools, um, but didn't want to pay somebody to come to the farm for three or four days to learn. So we kind of stepped in to fill that void and we're on to our fourth iteration next week. And like, it's a range of people that attend. So from people that are trimming on farm, professional trimmers, um, and then also um, some veterinarians have kind of taken initiative and come back for either continuing education or starting out. 
Yeah, that's good. So it's interesting because like when we talk about dreaming, you have like preventive dreaming that happens and this is a discussion, but I, I would like want to gear our conversation today to like mostly like the treatment dreaming. Uh, and in that, like, which cows are we dreaming? Like, uh, can we identify it well? Like, like are we treating the cows that we need to treat or which ones should we start with? <laughs> um, that's a longer than seven minute conversation. Um, but yeah, so I'm a big believer in strategic trimming, which kind of treats preventative trimming as one aspect. Um, and then trying to focus on those cows and we can talk about that later. But then when we get to kind of therapeutic trimming, so cows that need to be trimmed, um, I like to think that there's kind of like three different populations of those type of cows. There's a the newly lame cow. So those are cows that have really never been lame. And we try to find those cows with strong detection programs, whether it be technology or people. Um, and then there's kind of the recheck cow. So once they've been treated, they should be on a recheck list, especially if they've received the block. And then there's their chronic cows. And then I structure my trimming programs for those cows more aggressively. So those are the kind of the cows that have had a history of lesions, because we have to remember that lameness is a chronic condition, whether it be digital dermatitis or sole ulcers on white lines or hoof horn lesions. Um, once they have a hoof horn lesion, there's bony changes that happen inside. So that cow is basically chronically affected. Think, think of like they have bone spurs. So I would argue we need to manage those cows differently than a healthy cow. Um, so when I look at trimming programs and trimming records, I always split out the new cases from the chronic cases because they're probably different risk factors and different interventions we need to do for those cows. Yeah, so just to understand a little more about that that you just mentioned, because in the beginning you mentioned like you believe and you think that we still have too many lame cows, right? And now we're talking about like this different populations. And in a sense, like the 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 rechecks are the new cases or whatever the chronic case that we're rechecking what you just did. But like like if you think about the the new and the chronic cases, like what what's the proportion like that we have within our populations? So when we in some of the studies we've done and some of the data we've looked at, the problem is mainly the chronic cases. As an industry, we probably we've done a probably a better job. Like asked me before, like is, are things getting better? I think we're getting better at creating less new lame cases. So when we take out the chronic cows and we do a study and says like how many new cases we found, we can get. For some lesions, less than 1%. For most of them, less than 5% over a year. Um, so I would argue like some of them are at levels, like less than 1%. I can't get much lower with whatever preventive program I do. But then if we look, include all the cases, so including the chronics, then we're at like 20, 30, 40% of cases over a time period or over a year. And that's why we end up with these high prevalences. And that's why I would argue lameness is still too high because there's too many chronic cases walking around. And those cases are easy. Like even I always tell this to students too, like I, we can walk on the farm. They cannot tell me which cow is not pregnant. They cannot tell me which cow has mastitis or has ketosis, which is something that I work with, but they can point out the lame cow. Yes. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy for an untrained eye to see. Uh, but it's interesting what you mentioned about the chronic cases. Cause then uh, what in my mind, what I'm thinking is like, now if we implement any, and the strategy to better uh, for the betterment of the lameness condition at the farm, it'll take a long time for it to to see effects, right? Like it, if you're, we're dealing with chronic cows, it's not going to be you snap your finger and you're going to have it. No, and I think sometimes we get into trouble when we when we make changes and people are like, oh, my lameness didn't get all that better. I still see these lame cows, and like you're right, you're not going to see changes unless you look at your like clean population, which typically is first lactation animals, right? Because those are kind of a good indicator. So I think you're right. We have to be very clear and specific to say, if we're going to make a change, either in a trimming program or a foot bath program, you're mainly going to see the effect on cows that have never had a case of lameness. The other cows, they've been, for lack of a better word, screwed up for their life already. So we have to manage those. And I think we can manage them, but... Um, for new interventions, we have to make sure we monitor the right population. And like, just quickly, you mentioned like this managing differently. So like, can you like just summarize quickly? What, how, how would you suggest managing some of those cases, especially the chronic ones? So the chronic cases, especially ones that have had hoof horn lesions, so sole ulcers and white line, I would probably trim them 
depending on the dairy, but anywhere from three to six months. So if there's not a lot of wear on the dairy, I would probably trim them closer to the three months. If there's more wear on the dairy, they would go on a like a, what we consider a routine six months program. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is kind of take the weight off the spots that create problems. Um, so they usually sole ulcer area or the white line area um, and prevent the reoccurrence of lameness. So they're still going to walk kind of funny, but you're just preventing from trying to prevent an active lesion from showing up. No, it's like we're coming up to the time here. Like, as you said, like I asked you a question, a few questions ago. And so like, this is like definitely more than seven minutes uh, is response. And this is a topic that definitely needs more discussion and we, we need to learn more about it and be more proactive about it. I would like to uh, uh, thank you for uh, sharing this uh, valuable information with us and hopefully we can get you here again uh, in a different opportunity. You're welcome, the sun. Thank you all for watching this uh, this episode of uh, Dairy Health Black Belt by Wise Medics. Uh, if you like this conversation, uh, subscribe to the channel. It will let you know when more uh, chapter, more uh, episodes will come out. And we're always talking about the the, the topics that are very uh, relevant to the dairy industry. I'm Luciano Cacheta, and I'm signing off today. Thank you.